Greetings, true believers, and welcome to another astonishing episode of History of the Marvel Universe. Today's tale begins 20 millennia ago with two ancient civilizations, Atlantis and Lemuria. While Atlantis was a powerful nation populated by prehistoric humans, the kingdom of Lemuria was ruled by the monstrous race known as the Deviants. The Deviants themselves were the creation of one of the most ancient and powerful races in the known cosmos, the Celestials. One million years prior, the Celestials came to Earth to observe and experiment on the ape-like ancestors of mankind. While many of their test subjects were released seemingly unchanged, they had been endowed with great potential for genetic mutation. Others became godlike and took to the mountains to become the Eternals. The Deviants, however, were aberrations and went on to establish the Kingdom of Lemuria. However, they also subjugated many humans within their empire. Desperate for freedom, the human alchemists of Lemuria allied themselves with the Serpent Men, the reptilian children of the Elder God Set. Together, they crafted an artifact which allowed the wearer to channel the power of the Elder God himself, the Serpent Crown. Adorning himself with the crown, a man named Atra confronted the deviant Emperor Faraug. Unfortunately, Atra and his alchemists had been used as pawns, for Set had promised Fraug the serpent crown in exchange for his undying worship. Fraug and Atra fought over the powerful item, not realizing their struggle was ultimately pointless. For in the skies above Lemuria, the Celestials had returned to Earth. The Deviants fired upon their creators, suspecting their new god would protect them. And to call what happened next retaliation would be somewhat inaccurate. The Deviants were no threat to the Celestials, and so when the space god struck, it was not a counterattack. It was judgment. Their blast shook the entire planet, and the resulting devastation would be remembered for tens of thousands of years as the Great Cataclysm. Lemuria was destroyed, its broken fragments and myriad corpses sinking to the bottom of the sea. So widespread was the ruination that Atlantis as well was washed away, also coming to rest on the ocean floor. For 10,000 years, the city lay dormant beneath the waves, until one day, they came. The water-breathing humanoids now known as Homo Mermanus. Having descended from denizens of the original Atlantis, some say this new race was granted gills by the ocean god Neptune to suit their new environment. They settled into their ancestral home and began to rebuild, reclaiming the names of old to become known as Atlanteans. And yet not all stayed, and 500 years later one faction chose to leave. As fate would have it, their pilgrimage led them to the destroyed remains of Lemuria, where they began to build their new empire. However, it seems the magic of the Serpent God Set still permeated the area, as the new Lemurians developed snake-like scales unlike their Atlantean siblings. But then one day, the Serpent Crown was discovered, still gripped by the corpses of Atra and Fraug. Sensing the eldritch power contained within, the Lemurian Emperor Naga donned the crown, ushering in a reign of terror which lasted several hundred years. Eventually, a group of Lemurian telepaths decided to take matters into their own hands. Using their mental powers to get past the guards, the rebels entered Naga's chamber while he slept and stole the serpent crown. Using a potion allowing them to survive out of the water and pass for human, they brought the crown to an abandoned Antarctic outpost built by the pre-cataclysmic Atlanteans. They then encased the crown in a metal shell designed to dull its power. After this, some of them decided to leave the outpost and, for a time at least, live among the humans. 
As the decades rolled on, Piscatos, one of the Lemurians to remain behind, grew old and sick. When another, Beckett, finally returned, he saw that his brother had succumbed to temptation and donned the crown in the hopes of staving off death. The crown corrupted Piscatos and he struck down his old ally with its power. However, the grief he felt from this vile action allowed him to break free from Set's influence. Forsaking the crown's power, Piscatos took his own life, and with his dying breath he set the outpost to self-destruct, in the hopes of burying the demonic artifact forever. While the world at large would never learn the truth of what happened there, stories told by Beckett before his death became legend and rumor. Eventually, it was written that a civilization of telepaths called the Ancients once dwelt in Antarctica. In the meantime, the Atlanteans were caught in the midst of their own struggle with a rogue faction called the Skarka. The aggressors were eventually defeated, but much of the city they'd worked so hard to build was destroyed, and their king was slain. The young prince Thakor ascended to the throne and led his people away from their ancestral home to a place they could be safe and secure. But fate has a way of making things converge and a new Atlantis was built beneath the frozen waters of Antarctica. There it remained in peace and solitude for decades until the year 1915 when a ship called the Endurance sank in the icy waters while searching for deposits of Antarctic vibranium. Half a decade later in 1920, a second ship, the Oracle, was dispatched to retrieve the valuable cargo and equipment left behind by the Endurance. However, one passenger, a man named Paul Destine, had joined the expedition for a different reason. Destine was a telepath with the power to read minds, and while his abilities were somewhat limited, he longed to expand them. After reading the legends of the telepathic ancients dwelling in the Antarctic, Destine convinced Captain Leonard Mackenzie to allow him to join his voyage. With what happened to the previous ship and great concern for the safety of his men, Captain Mackenzie took no chances in navigating the ice fields and used explosives to clear a path. How could he have known the consequences his actions would have on the hidden city beneath the ice? Knowing the icefall could not have been natural, Thakor commanded his daughter, the Princess Fen, to send an expedition of their own to investigate. However, the princess was stubborn and adventurous, and decided to take matters into her own hands. After obtaining a potion that would allow her to breathe outside of the water for up to five hours at a time, Fen climbed aboard the mysterious vessel. She confronted the strange men on board, and while she likely could have defeated them, she allowed herself to be captured until she could learn more. And so the mysterious blue woman was brought before the captain. But then something unexpected happened. Despite being from two different worlds, there was a strange mutual attraction between them. While Destine theorized she was one of the so-called ancients he was searching for, the rest of the crew eventually came to believe that she was merely a castaway from another country, turned blue by the frigid waters. And so Princess Fen remained on board the Oracle acting as a spy for her people. The captain actually helped her by teaching her English, and indeed the princess was a quick study. There was of course still the matter of her father, but one night Fen returned home, and she convinced Thakor to allow her to continue her self-appointed mission. While she could not forget the damage that the ship had caused, she came to understand that none of it was intentional. Furthermore, she found herself eagerly awaiting the chance to spend more time with the captain. Before long, her feelings were undeniable and, as it turns out, reciprocated. Despite themselves, Princess Fen of Atlantis and Captain Leonard Mackenzie had fallen in love with each other. Not long after this, the captain proposed and the two became husband and wife. Unfortunately, Fen knew that she could not return to America as the potion she used to breathe the air was in limited supply. 
However, she fully intended to enjoy all the pleasures of her new husband with the time they had. While the crew of the Oracle failed to find the wreck of the Endurance, they had one more promised destination before they could return to the United States. The supposed location of the mythical ancients that Paul Destine was intent on finding. And indeed, Destine and Mackenzie came upon the power generator used by the Lemurian rebels, still buried in ice. In a fit of madness, Destine began hacking away at the ice wall, believing the machine would somehow give him the power he desired. Frightened by the strange man's frenzied obsession, the captain backed away to consult with his men. Not a moment too soon, it seems, as an avalanche covered the cave entrance behind him. Yes, while Paul Destine was successful in reactivating the ancient dynamo, the half-destroyed shelter was unable to handle the vibrations and collapsed upon him. However, what Mackenzie didn't know is that Destine survived the cave-in. He awakened in near darkness and caught sight of a strange glowing helmet which seemed almost to call to him. Captain Mackenzie returned to his wife, intent on leaving the frozen continent behind forever. Fenn attempted to tell her husband the truth, but after spending so much time out of the water, she had grown weak and her frantic confessions appeared to be some sort of illness-induced delusion. However, this became a moot point when Thakur sent his best soldier, Krang, to lead a war party to retrieve the princess. The Atlanteans struck hard and fast, and in the resulting battle, Leonard Mackenzie was shot. The captain survived his wounds, but Fenn never knew that as she was dragged back into the sea by her own people. Mackenzie gave the order to go after them and rescue his wife, but his commands were ignored. And so the two newlyweds were pulled apart by their own people, each believing the other to be God forever. Although their time together was brief, their union would prove to have far-reaching consequences, as some months later the Princess Fen gave birth to their hybrid child. Water-breathing like his mother, but pale-skinned like his father, the newborn prince was called Namor an Atlantean word meaning avenging son. Despite his half-human heritage, Namor proved to be as good a swimmer as any full-blooded Atlantean. In fact, as he grew older, he proved to be faster and more agile than any of his peers. And despite occasional teasing, he did have friends among the other Atlantean children. There was Dorma, a young girl who was often vying for Namor's affection. There was another prince, Bira, and their mutual friend, Murano. And finally, there was his tomboyish cousin, Namora. She was the only one who could rival Namor's speed and strength. And Namor soon proved himself to be far stronger than the average Atlantean. And this was not the limit of Namor's hybrid abilities, as one day while playing with his male friends, he was separated from them and trapped above the ice. Frightened of being reprimanded, Bira kept silent until Princess Fen, sensing something was wrong, confronted him. A rescue party came above water to retrieve the prince, only to find that he had no difficulty breathing the air. After this, Fen would often accompany her son on the ice fields. Using her potion to breathe out of the water, she tutored her son English just as her husband had tutored her. During one such lesson, the ice suddenly shifted, causing them both to fall into a frozen crevice. Even more unexpectedly, Namor kicked himself upwards and found himself able to soar through the air. Diving down, the young prince retrieved his injured mother and flew her back home. There, the supposed source of his flight was discovered, as tiny wings had appeared on his ankles. It's unclear how the small appendages are capable of such a feat, but it soon became evident that Prince Namor was more than a hybrid. Indeed, the so-called Submariner's powers and abilities also stemmed from the genetic potential instilled into mankind by the Celestials one million years prior. Prince Namor was one of the world's first recorded mutants. However, the world would not be introduced to him until 1939. 
The 18-year-old prince led a mission to collect valuables and supplies from a sunken vessel, but had mistakenly left his knife behind. Since the blade was a gift from his grandfather Thakur, he sought to retrieve it, borrowing his mother's knife for the journey. However, when he arrived, he witnessed what he thought to be some sort of robotic invaders. Frightened by the strange creatures, Namor cut the power cables connecting them to their vessel. Since this did not completely halt their movements, he used his mother's knife to finish one and his bare hands to crush the helm of another. A third figure dropped down to investigate but quickly retreated after seeing what had happened. Before the ship could escape, Namor grabbed the propeller and, with his uncanny strength, forced it to run aground. Then, taking the two dead automatons, the Submariner returned to Atlantis. However, the prince was shocked and horrified to learn that they were not robots, but strangely garbed surface men. Bira and Thakor, on the other hand, agreed that it was time for the Avenging Sun to live up to his name. Even his mother encouraged this, seemingly having grown resentful of the Americans over the past 19 years. And so a conflicted Namor was dispatched on his quest to bring war to the surface world. Dorma attempted to accompany him, but after their first encounter with the humans, Namor convinced her to head home. And of course, Namor's journey to the surface world brought him to New York City. Entering from an underwater pipe, the Submariner burst forth into the world of man. He did not attack at first, instead intending to watch and learn. However, a misstep onto a live power grid sent a painful electric shock throughout his body. In a savage rage, Namor perceived this as an attack and began a super-powered rampage in the streets of New York. Furthermore, this much exertion while outside of the water resulted in an oxygen imbalance within Namor's brain, making him more irrational and violent. Thus began a prolonged campaign of terror and intimidation as the savage Submariner sought to prove his superiority. It's unclear how many people were hurt, but it does seem that Namor focused his efforts on destroying vehicles and property rather than flat-out murder. The police were desperate to stop his rampage, and so a brave and intelligent officer named Betty Dean volunteered for a dangerous plan. Watching the water for several nights, Officer Dean waited until she caught sight of her target. An expert swimmer, she then quickly changed into her swimsuit and dove into the water. She began thrashing and pretending to drown, hoping to catch the Submariner's attention. Her ploy seemed to work as the young man attempted to rescue the flailing female. Brought to the surface, Betty Dean held her gun to Namor's head and gave him one chance to surrender. This moment was all the young prince needed to slap the weapon from the policewoman's hand. Dean was unintimidated, but an irritated Namor began dragging her out to sea. However, the two were interrupted when they came across a British freighter under fire from a Nazi submarine. This is when Namor began to realize that while the humans vastly outnumbered the Atlanteans, they were also greatly divided. Seeing men plummet to a watery doom struck a chord with Namor, and for reasons he didn't fully comprehend, he grabbed their sinking vessel from underwater and ran it aground on a nearby island. Betty Dean then told Namor about the terrible war that was billowing overseas. She also suspected that someone as powerful as he might be able to turn the tide of battle. It seems Namor quickly began to admire Dean, and he happily honored her request to take down the Nazi U-boat. He then took to the sky, declaring that while he would allow peaceful vessels to cross unhindered, he would attack any warships he spotted in his waters, regardless of which side they were on. Meanwhile, the police still wished to bring Namor to justice, and fortunately for them, it seems they found just the way to do so. You see, while the Submariner was one of the first publicly known superhumans, he wasn't the only one. 
Jim Hammond, the original Human Torch was also unleashed on the world during this time. And unlike Namor, the Torch fully allied himself with the forces of law and order. And so, when the police asked Hammond to bring in the aquatic menace, what followed was a historic moment. New York City's earliest recorded battle between super-powered opponents. The very first Clash of Marvels. This fight ultimately ended in a stalemate when Namor, unable to defeat the Torch, trapped his flaming opponent within a translate tube. But Officer Dean then arrived and attempted to broker a truce between them. Namor initially agreed, and a begrudging respect grew between the two warriors. There are some conflicting reports detailing further battles between them, but their veracity is unconfirmed. However, their enmity would be put on hold after Nazi submarines attacked Atlantis. Emperor Thakor was badly injured, and Prince Namor stepped up to rule in his stead. Furthermore, it was discovered that the Nazis had learned their location from Namor's childhood friend, Murano. Believing their victory to be inevitable, Murano forged an alliance with Hitler's forces and became known as the U-Man. This led to Namor forging an uneasy alliance with the United States and fighting alongside their champion, Captain America. Not long after this, America itself would be drawn into the Second World War when Japanese forces bombed Pearl Harbor. And so, for the first time, Earth's mightiest heroes found themselves united against a common threat. To face a force no single superhero could withstand. On that day, the invaders were formed to battle Axis forces wherever they appeared. The war raged for several years, but eventually the Nazis were defeated and Hitler himself met his end at the flaming hands of the Human Torch. After this, the United States displayed their atomic might, forcing Japan's unconditional surrender. It seems that Namor had overtaxed his abilities during the war and he found his powers of flight waning. He returned home to Atlantis, hoping to recover, only to find Bira and Krang waiting for him. As it turns out, in the four years that Namor was absent, Emperor Thakor had awakened, and Prince Bira convinced Thakor to banish Namor. His mother convinced him that violence would not be the answer here, and so Namor left Atlantis, swearing to someday return. He then reunited with the Human Torch as a member of the newly formed All Winners Squad. Then, in 1947, Namor was invited home for his grandfather's birthday. In truth, his cousin Namora had helped Fen and Dorma convince Thakor to end Namor's exile. Unfortunately, while he made the journey back, Atlantis was attacked and pillaged by human criminals. The Submariner sought justice, but would not go alone as Namora had recently learned that she too was a human-Atlantean hybrid after her skin changed color. The two joined forces and became a crime-fighting duo both on land and in the sea. After this, they both became close friends with Betty Dean, and Namora and Betty even became roommates for a time. Namor returned home to Atlantis for several years to help rebuild, but was all too happy to lend a hand whenever Betty or Namora needed him. Finally, in 1955, Atlantean scientists devised a way to rejuvenate Namor's lost strength and restore his ability to fly. As Namor suspected, Thakor had facilitated this feat so that his grandson could renew the war on humanity he had abandoned 15 years prior. But this time, Namor refused, having come to realize that declaring war on an entire planet was sheer folly. Instead, the prince decided to pursue admittance to the United Nations so that Atlantis could become a part of the world at large. And although Namor's service during World War II had earned him an official pardon for his earlier crimes, some were not as forgiving. A trigger-happy onlooker opened fire on the prince, only for the bullet to ricochet off the Submariner's impenetrable skin and kill an innocent bystander. 
Before the scene could erupt into a full-scale riot, the Atlanteans withdrew, deciding to remain separate from the surface world. Even the violent Krang agreed that war with humanity was not one Atlantis could win, at least not at that time. And so, the Atlanteans remained isolated, during which time Namor and Dorma began to grow closer, much to Krang's jealousy. Then one day, a mysterious sea quake heralded the coming of some new threat. Assembling a scouting party of Atlantean soldiers, Namor departed to investigate the source. However, as they approached, a mysterious energy blast struck, killing all except the mighty Submariner. With righteous fury, Namor emerged from the water to discover a freshly opened cave. Investigating further within the cave stood the being responsible for the attacks, a man calling himself Destiny, wearing a helmet of power. Little did Namor realize that Destiny was in fact Paul Destine, the telepath who had joined Leonard Mackenzie on his Antarctic expedition. Furthermore, his so-called Helmet of Power was actually the disguised Serpent Crown, which, despite being clad in Lemurian technology meant to dull its power, had kept Destiny alive since 1920. Namor struck, attempting to end the villain quickly, but it seems Destiny had grown too powerful. Reaching out with the might of the Serpent Crown, Destiny destroyed the Atlantean Palace, killing both Emperor Thakor and Princess Fen. As one final insult, the insane villain then attacked Namor's very mind, robbing him not only of his memory, but his very sense of self. Before returning to a state of suspended animation to continue gathering his power, Destiny sent the Submariner away, intending to one day test his strength against him once more. He flew long and far, eventually ending back where his journey into the surface world began. New York City. Confused and disoriented, Namor stole a set of clothes to cover himself and wandered the streets. His unique distinguishing features were eventually covered by hair as the weeks turned to years. Although the decades passed, stories of the Submariner and his allies were immortalized in comic book stories, fictionalized tellings of their real-life exploits. Though those legendary heroes of World War II had all but disappeared, eventually a new age dawned. The Marvel Age of Heroes, and it all began with the coming of the Fantastic Four. As fate would have it, one of this fearless foursome possessed powers nearly identical to Namor's Golden Age ally, and so Johnny Storm became the new Human Torch. And fittingly enough, this new Torch would soon be responsible for the Submariner's return. After an argument with his teammates, Johnny Storm sought shelter in a Bowery flophouse. The other occupants boasted of an old vagrant strength, but the bearded man simply shoved them aside. Realizing the old man was suffering from amnesia, Johnny attempted to help by using his precise control over his flame to burn away his unkempt beard, thus revealing the unmistakable features of the Submariner. Seeking to restore the forgotten hero, the Human Torch then took Namor and flew him over the water. Dropping him in, Johnny had hoped that a return to his natural element would help the Submariner remember his past. At first, this seemed to be a success as Namor tossed aside his disguise and reclaimed his identity. However, he rushed to a nearby Atlantean outpost only to find it completely destroyed. With his memory still damaged and his mind clouded, he sensed that his home was also gone, but did not recall the man called Destiny. Emerging from the water, an enraged Namor blamed the surface world for the destruction of Atlantis and declared war on the human race once more. Using an ancient horn hidden in the water, he summoned the monstrous creature Giganto to assault New York. The monster was only defeated when Ben Grimm, another member of the Fantastic Four, carried a powerful explosive directly into the belly of the beast. 
While Giganto was dead, Namor boasted that he could summon countless creatures as long as he held the horn of Proteus. And so Susan Storm, the invisible girl, attempted to relieve him of it. However, in these early days, she was young and inexperienced, and so Namor was able to seize her, only to find himself smitten with the Fantastic Four's female member. The addled Submariner claimed he would call off his assault if the Invisible Girl agreed to be his bride. However, the Human Torch had no intention of letting his sister sacrifice her freedom and used his flaming powers to create an artificial tornado, launching the Submariner back out to sea. In the confusion of this, Namor lost his grip on the Horn of Proteus, which came to rest in an unknown location. Of course, this was not the end of the Submariner, and he was convinced to seek vengeance on the Fantastic Four by their arch-nemesis, Doctor Doom. Even after being betrayed by Doom and helping to defeat him, Namor returned to battle members of the heroic foursome several more times. Then one day, the improbable happened and Namor happened on a new Atlantis being built. In the intervening years, Prince Bira had taken up the crown and led the Atlantean people to this new location. However, the people rejoiced at the return of Thakor's true heir, and Prince Namor was crowned the new ruler of Atlantis. Furthermore, despite promising herself to the warlord Krang, Lady Dorma could not deny her true love. She left her fiancé and returned to the arms of her childhood friend. With his people at his side once more, Namor's next attack on the surface world was a full-scale invasion. However, this was repelled when Mr. Fantastic crafted a device which remotely drained the water from the Atlantean soldiers' suits, forcing them to return to the ocean. Furthermore, when the Invisible Girl was injured, Namor rushed her to a hospital, causing his people to lose faith in his conviction. For a brief period, they abandoned him, during which time he battled the newly formed Avengers. As fate would have it, in Namor's rage and frustration, he dislodged a chunk of ice containing a strangely humanoid figure, allowing it to float to warmer waters. This figure was quickly found by the Avengers, who discovered it to be none other than Captain America, the Submariner's wartime ally. After these battles, some Atlanteans began returning to Namor to reaffirm their loyalty to their rightful Emperor. However, this loyalty was tested when Namor insisted on one final attempt to capture the heart of the Invisible Girl. This was interrupted when Doctor Strange helped the other members of the Fantastic Four locate Namor's undersea palace. It was during the ensuing battle that the Atlantean warriors realized they could not abandon their true ruler. However, this battle was ended thanks to the Invisible Girl's recently developed force field powers. Susan then explained in no uncertain terms that her heart would never be his, and Namor abandoned his quest to win her love. This did not stop his spurned love, Dorma, from opening the gates of Atlantis for an undersea barbarian clan descended from the Skarka and their leader, the mighty Atuma. However, the attackers proved to be more violent and devastating than Dorma had anticipated. Desperate for help, she turned to the Fantastic Four who joined the fight to save Atlantis. While the FF handled the attacking forces, Namor was able to defeat Atuma himself. Atuma was not the only one with eyes for the throne of Atlantis, and sometime later the warlord Krang convinced Namor that his people deserved a place among the surface world. Heeding this notion, Namor attempted to make his case in a court of law. However, the proceedings were interrupted by Dorma, who reported that Krang had started a rebellion in Namor's absence. The Submariner rushed back to his kingdom, but Krang and his loyalists had already subjugated the rest of Atlantis. Of course, Namor soon escaped, proved his worthiness, and defeated Krang, reclaiming his kingdom. 
Sometime after this, the Submariner received a psychic vision compelling him to travel to the Antarctic once more. And so Prince Namor again came face to face with Destiny, who had awoken once more after many years of gathering strength from his helmet of power. With his telepathic abilities, Destiny revealed his own past, including his connection to Namor's father, Leonard Mackenzie. Seeking again to test his power, the mad villain attacked Namor, leaving him buried in a cascading avalanche of ice. By the time Namor forced himself free, Destiny was gone. But the experience had restored the Submariner's lost memories and he swore revenge. While he made more enemies and allies in the interim, he eventually tracked down Destiny and confronted him a final time. But for all his strength and rage, it would not be the Submariner that ultimately defeated Paul Destine. No, Destiny's madness would be his own undoing when he tossed aside his crown, confident in his own power, and attempted to fly from the top of a building, only to plummet to his demise. American authorities attempted to claim Destiny's helmet of power, but the Submariner stole it for himself, leading to another confrontation with Ben Grimm, the Thing. However, this battle was ended by the arrival of one elderly woman who convinced the Submariner to stop his rampage. She introduced herself as Mrs. Prentice, but Namor had once known her under a different name. The brave and noble policewoman, Officer Betty Dean. Namor had hoped the Helmet of Power would be safe in Atlantis, but it was there that it shed its dampening guise to reveal the true form of the Serpent Crown. Now unhindered, the Serpent Crown reached out and briefly possessed Dorma, but soon found its way back to the possession of the first one to effectively use it, the Lemurian King Naga, still clinging to life. Fortunately, the Lemurian warrior Carthon aided Namor and struck down the Mad King once and for all. While the Lemurians escaped safely, it was too late to save their city as the energies unleashed destroyed Lemuria and buried the Serpent Crown. But this would not be the final threat to come out of Lemuria as Lyra, a human-Lemurian hybrid, also desired undersea domination. In one encounter, Lyra nearly ended the lives of both Namor and his beloved Dorma. However, Dorma was able to summon the last of her strength and strike Lyra, thus rescuing Namor from the countless leeches at her telepathic command. Unfortunately, Namor was too late to save his beloved as Lyra had left Dorma to suffocate in the air. After Dorma's death, Namor left Atlantis for a time, but he would inevitably return to lead his people once more. As for Lyra, Namor later defeated her with the help of Namorita, the daughter of his cousin Namora. Since then, the Submariner has been a defender, an Avenger, and an X-Man. He has also stood alongside his former enemy, Mr. Fantastic, and other powerful and influential individuals as a member of the secret cabal, the Illuminati. Whether the world sees him as a hero or a villain, the Submariner remains the king of Atlantis, and always puts the needs of his own people above any others. And that is the origin of Namor, the savage Submariner. But thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please leave a like, share the video, and subscribe for more Marvelous content. Be sure to leave a comment letting me know what Marvel hero or villain you want to hear about next. And as always, the issues referenced in this video are listed in the description below if you would like to read them for yourself, as well as links to other places you can find me, including my Patreon page, where for only a dollar a month, you can get your name in these special thanks here. So until next time, true believers, Imperious Rex.